Hello, this is Peter Tush, Curator of Education at the Dolly Museum, and it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about Dolly and his landscape and his environment in relation to the Selby Garden Exhibition, Gardens of the Mind. I'm going to be sharing my screen with you, so hopefully this will go well. And what you will see here is that this exhibition, or this talk actually, is called Dolly's Environment, A Geological Delirium. And this is a talk that um, I've given before, mostly related to Clyde Butcher and his photographs, which I'm also going to be sharing with you. But uh, it seemed really appropriate, given the uh, Selby Garden exhibition, to share this with you as well. So, of course, there is the Gardens of the Mind exhibition, which is absolutely stunning. Um, the horticulture team down at Selby Gardens has done an amazing job interpreting Dolly's ideas to something that really is environmental and dreamlike and stunning. And just to refer back to Salvador Dali and the reason for the title of this talk, Dali referred to his landscape along the Mediterranean as a grandiose geological delirium. So it's ornate, it's over the top, and it is delirious in the same way that dreams are delirious. And so Dolly has really tried to incorporate and draw on his environment when he created his most dreamlike and imaginative paintings. And that's what we're gonna be looking at today. So the goal for this talk is to introduce Selby visitors to the deep connections between Dolly and his Mediterranean environment, and also to share a few of Clyde Butcher's amazing photographs of Dolly's environment from a show that we did in 2018 focusing on Clyde Butcher's photos of Dolly's landscape. So let's start by talking a little bit about what the Selby horticulture team has created throughout the gardens in Sarasota. Um, a lot of the ideas that we initially had came from the garden that we created at our own museum when we opened in 2011. We created a garden that was partially Florida and partially Mediterranean. So it has some aspects of Dolly's landscape and also some familiar aspects of the Florida landscape. The idea behind our garden was to give our visitors an opportunity to rest and relax, be refreshed, and also to amplify the experience of the gallery. So a lot of our plantings and a lot of the ideas of our garden draw on ideas that are specifically related to Dali. For example, the rock that you can see on the left-hand side here is actually um, a rock that came from the landscape very close to where Dolly was born. So it has a bit of the Catalan feel of the rocks that he referred to as the grandiose geological delirium. There's also bromeliads, which have perfect mathematical ratios to them. And there's a garden that has references to some of the math from Dolly's work. For example, here you can see one of our pavers, which has this perfect mathematical spiral. And then you start to see that some of our plantings also play up on that kind of spiral formation. When we get down to Sarasota and we start looking at what the team put together in the gardens, it's pretty astounding how much they drew from Dolly, the diversity of their choices, and how really stunning the results are. And for me, one of the absolute quintessential moments of exploring the gardens is encountering the piano that seems to float within the water which has this incredible array of bromeliads and plants blossoming from its interior. Um, Dolly has placed a lot of pianos in his landscapes. Uh, for example, the one on the left, on the right hand side, this is called uh, Necrophilia Fountain. It's in a private collection, but you can see that it's this very curious piano that also looks like a very large table. It's become a fountain and it's got a cypress tree growing up inside of it. Um, there's a very interesting reference from Dolly's own history that explains why he placed so many pianos into landscapes. When he was young and his family would go to Katakaz to their summer home, there were some very good friends next door who had a number of musicians in the family. They would have summer concerts where they would bring the piano from their house out onto the rocks along the beach and they would have these amazing evening concerts. They delighted Dolly, he, he was very fond of them and it led to this kind of dreamlike idea of a piano encountered where you don't expect to find one. 
Another um, image from Dolly that the horticulture team has captured is the disembodied eyeball that seems to float and keep uh, track of us. Um, on the right-hand side, this is actually a floating eyeball Dolly designed as part of the dream sequence for a movie he did with Alfred Hitchcock called Spellbound. So this was one of the studies for it. And you see how clearly it rhymes with what's, uh, what you'll encounter in the Selby Gardens. This is another um, item that you'll find within the, uh, the greenhouse. On the right-hand side, you can see the wonderful, strange environmental experience of a face with the eyeball and the sofa lips. The sofa lips was actually a design Dolly came up with in the 1930s, about 1935 to 36. He was working with a, a collector of his, a man named Edward James, and Edward James liked this idea so much, the lips were based on the lips of Mae West, so sex symbol lips, um, that he actually had several of these made for his house. So on the left-hand side, you can see one of these lip sofas or saliva sofas that he had in his house. And on the bottom left-hand side, this brooch is one of the most sensational jewelry items that Dolly created. It is based on a bad pun. It is a ruby lips with teeth of pearls. And indeed, the lips are made of rubies, the teeth are made of pearls, and it's beautiful, and it's silly, and it's very kitsch, and it's very much in keeping with the kind of inventiveness that Dolly brought to his uh, approach to art. Another thing that you'll encounter throughout the Selby Gardens are a lot of um, eggs. There are eggs that you will find all over the place, sprouting all kinds of strange and unusual things, like these wonderful pitcher plants on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, this is a photograph from about, I believe, 1948 to 49. It was done with Philippe Halsman, and essentially Dolly has placed himself within an egg. And this is partially a reference back to Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci painted his uh, Lita and the Swan uh, as if Lita laid eggs that became her children, that the children hatched out of, much like a bird would lay eggs. And so Dolly has sort of embraced that idea. He's placed himself within this egg, and he's also referencing his own painting that's in the Dolly Museum in St. Petersburg, The Geopoliticus Child, where the new man born during World War II actually emerges out of the United States within a world that's basically like a soft egg. So this idea of eggs and birth from eggs has a very surreal and dreamlike quality to it, and you'll find it, you'll encounter it quite often in the Selby Gardens right now. There's also uh, several references to spirals that you'll find out at Selby. Um, Dolly was obsessed, especially in the late 40s and early 50s, with the mathematical properties of the golden ratio, the perfect proportion of the golden ratio, and all of the different things, ways that you can see it in nature. And one of the key ways that you'll see it are the spirals that can be found in nature. Um, and so the painting on the right-hand side, this is called Nature More Vivant. And it's a painting that means basically still life, fast moving. And Dolly has created the still life as, as, as if it has exploded and yet been photographed by, um, by Harold Edgerton. So fast motion camera shot. The piece that looks a little bit, the object that looks a little bit like a meteor on the far right-hand side, that's actually a, um, a head of cauliflower. And you'll notice it has a strange pattern to it. That's the pattern of the Fibonacci sequence. It's a growth pattern that has a perfect mathematical property to it. Dolly placed that within his painting to refer to his new enthusiasm for the golden ratio. There's also in the middle, there's a fruit dish and then a second fruit dish, which is spiraling and disintegrating. And that's based on the golden ratio. And finally, on the left-hand side, there's a hand holding a rhinoceros horn a rhinoceros horn also has a golden spiral or golden ratio, ratio to its growth proportion. And actually the very last thing to mention is that the banister on the outside of this painting, you'll notice that the banister itself has a double helix spiral shape. That's a reference to the double helix shape of the DNA molecule. So Dolly was very interested in science and math and trying to combine those in a sense, in a sort of religious sense in the 1950s. There's also the beautiful butterfly garden that has been created on the, the grounds of Selby. And in the backdrop, you can see there's a, a large photograph. Um, 
Dolly was fascinated by, by butterflies. And in the 1950s and 60s, there are many butterflies within his work, I think as a symbol of metamorphosis and transformation. It's something that Dolly delighted in, the sense that something could change into something new and different. And you'll see that in the garden, obviously in the uh, butterfly house, but also the photograph that's on the back part of the, the butterfly garden is by Clyde Butcher. And it's one of the amazing photographs he took in this region where Dolly grew up and lived almost all of his life around Catechez. This is a photograph of Catechez and you can see exactly what Dolly's referring to, a geological delirium, a grandiose geological delirium. And that photo really does place very beautifully this butterfly garden within Dolly's world. There's also, of course, the, uh, the exhibition itself that you can find in the, uh, in the gardens, in the um, art house. And this is a set of 12 photolithographs that Dolly had designed in the late 1960s and early 70s, where he combine, combines butterfly wings and floral prints in a really surreal dreamlike fashion. They're extremely popular and very beautiful. I think you'll enjoy them a lot. And now we come to the more broad discussion of Dolly's paintings and his relationship with his own landscape in the Cap de Creus um, region of Spain. So Dolly declared that his Catalan homeland was by far the most beautiful place in the world. His art responds to the Mediterranean delirium of this area, uh, which is on the jagged Costa Brava. There are the dreamlike beaches of Rosas, there's the rolling valleys, and then of course the awe-inspiring Pyrenees that are at the very top, uh, just underneath the, um, France. And it's been pointed out that Dali is one of the most, uh, one of the foremost landscape painters of the 20th century. So this idea about focusing on Dali's ideas within a landscape that you can see in the Selby Gardens very much is in keeping with his own approach to landscape painting. So this is the region that uh, is often referred to as Dolly Land, or at least the area that he's most associated with. It's in the very northeastern tip of Spain, and there are three particular regions. Uh, there's the region of Cadiquez, which is at the very bottom. That's where his family had a summer house, and his early paintings that are in the Impressionist style, almost all of those were created within the region of Cadiquez. When Dali became a little more successful and became a surrealist artist, he purchased a small fishing hut in Port Legat and turned it into this really exquisite manor. Um, so we'll see a couple photographs of that today. And then the area that's really identified with this geological delirium is Cap de Creus, right at the very, very top. This is the easternmost point in Spain, and it's where the Pyrenees crash into the Mediterranean. And it is absolutely, um, unlike any other place in the world. It's really stunning. And Dali draws a lot of inspiration from that in his paintings. So Dali said that the thing, uh, the thing which I call a landscape exists uniquely on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea and not elsewhere. The most curious of all is that where this landscape becomes best, most beautiful, most excellent, and most intelligent is precisely in the vicinity of Catechez. And what Dali is saying there is that there's not a single region in the world that can compare with the beauty and the diversity of the landscape he calls home, the Costa Brava. A lot of Dali's ideas are directly from his book, The Secret Life. A lot of the quotes that I'm sharing with you come from The Secret Life. And if you do want to understand the symbolism between, behind a lot of Dali's paintings, reading this book is a pretty essential um, uh, opportunity because Dolly does go into great detail about what many of his symbols um, actually mean. So it was published in 1942 and it captures the flavor of his devotion to this Mediterranean environment. One of Dolly's most well-known, if not the most well-known painting by him is The Persistence of Memory, painted in 1931 and in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. It's based on one of these really unusual rocks. The rock formation that you see on the left-hand side, this was always referred to by the Catalan fishermen as the head of Calero, because it looked like a head face resting on its nose or propped up on its nose. The chin would be 
just to the right of the nose, and then the forehead is above the nose. Dolly actually was very familiar with this rock and with the area, and he actually chose this particular rock to be his own self-portrait. So in the painting, The Persistence of Memory, that very soft, fluid head, which seems to have washed up on the beach, is in the exact same shape as that very, very hard rock from Capticreus. So Dolly's most singular act, which is to paint his own self-portrait, is indeed inspired by the environment in which he spent his time. So another, uh, this is a, a little more information about that painting. He says that this picture represented a landscape near Port Legat whose rocks were, were lighted by a transparent and melancholy twilight. In the foreground, an olive tree with its branches cut and without leaves. The other thing, just going back to it quickly, this is perhaps one of the most well-known paintings by Dali because of a very simple act of taking a very solid hard object, a watch, and turning it into, into a fluid kind of piece of taffy inspired by camembert cheese, that kind of runny cheese. And what happens, of course, is that we, we need a watch to tell time exactly. When a watch goes soft or becomes flaccid, it suddenly has no purpose. It can't tell us time. It can't work. And as a result, we're sort of thrown into a limbo. And it's that kind of anxiety that it represents that people connect with. But it's very much that idea of the hard and the soft that Dolly responds to directly in his own environment. This next pairing of a Clyde Butcher photograph and a painting from the Dolly collection shows a very early period of Dolly's career in relation to a really stunning photograph by Clyde Butcher. So this is Catechez, the area where Dolly's family had the summer home. This is a nighttime photograph from the hotel Clyde was staying in, looking at the church of Catechez under Mount Pawnee, that large mountain in the background. On the right-hand side, this is one of the more ambitious, very early paintings Dolly did when he became a student at the San Fernando Academy in Madrid. So in 1923, Dolly at this point is 19 years old, and he's looking at Cezanne, he's looking at Picasso, and he's fascinated by that kind of geometric abstraction, turning an environment into an abstract space. And yet there's something incredibly lyrical, very beautiful, very utopian about this painting, very much at odds with the idea of Dolly as the painter of dreamlike surreal images. There's no melting watches, there's no burning giraffes, there's no elephants with little spindly legs. This is a very, very beautiful painting that shows, I think, more clearly than almost anything else, Dolly's love of his homeland and how he saw his people as being part of that environment. Another quote that Dolly has about this idea of the soft and hard, he said that the long, the long meditative contemplation of these rocks has contributed powerfully to the flowering of the morphological aesthetics of the soft and the hard. So the study of shape, the morphology of the landscape led to Dolly turning a lot of solid objects into very fluid um, taffy-like objects and also turning soft objects into hardened bone-like uh, material. And we'll see a couple examples of that going forward. But here you can see Dolly and his wife Gala amongst those rocks in his Catalan environment along the beach. Here we have a photograph um, by Clyde Butcher showing the really dramatic sort of geometry of the rocks of this region. And on the left-hand side, this is a painting called Femme Couché of a woman lying upon one of these rocks in the water, a bather, very much inspired by Pablo Picasso, who Dolly had just met in 1926 prior to painting this. It's a painting in the Dolly Museum's collection, and you can see how that kind of ragged geometry, that very harsh geometry of the rocks correspond very accurately to the kind of uh, harshness of some of the Catalan um, rocks themselves. So that Dali was actually inspired, a lot of his mathematical reactions to the landscape were there to be captured and lead to some of his uh, discoveries. In a very different kind of world, the surreal dreamlike world, when Dali joins surrealism in 1929, he's also deeply inspired by the landscape 
And in particular, you can see in this photograph on the right-hand side by Clyde Butcher, these incredible pockmarked openings of the rocks along the, the Mediterranean. Dolly would often go searching for objects and detritus and things that had washed up and gotten lodged within these little openings. And he would take great delight in kind of exploring the treasure chest of his uh, homeland. On the left-hand side, you can see a painting called The Font from the very first year when Dolly joined Surrealism. It's a totally surreal environment, but one of the particular objects is this large sort of rock-like dolmen in the bottom uh, right-hand side, almost like one of those standing stones that you would see in Stonehenge. You can see that the rock has these openings that have been hollowed out. They're very much like the openings that you can see in the pockmarked rocks on the right-hand side in Clyde's photograph, and Dolly has filled them with some of the treasures associated with his obsessions. There's ants, there's screws, there's nails, there's a key. All of these things sort of represent those kind of treasures that Dolly might find within his environment, using them to drive forward these kind of dreamlike images, like his painting on the left. A little bit later, about three to four years later, Dolly is in the midpoint of his surrealist career in 1934, and he paints this really remarkable work called The Weaning of Furniture Nutrition. The woman seen here, she looks very much like a woman that Dolly would have seen every day, mending fishing nets. The women of the region of Port Legat and Cadiz, their husbands were fishermen. When they would go out to fish, the women would stay behind on the beach, and they would mend these large nets that would get um, torn through the course of the day. So the woman that Dolly is actually thinking of, though, is his nanny, the woman who raised him as a child, a woman named Lucia. And what you can see is that the painting looks like a photograph in every respect, except, of course, the woman in the center has a hole in her body that's supported by a crutch. And if you look at the object next to her, there's a chest of drawers, which are, is placed on the beach. It's curiously, you don't expect to see furniture on the beach, but we've already seen pianos on the beach. Here we have a chest on the beach, and it would fit perfectly like a jigsaw puzzle piece into her body. So Dolly has placed her in the environment. He's thinking about his nanny, the woman from his childhood, and he used to associate these pieces of furniture with her. This shows him transferring her or weaning her from the past to the present, and then taking that piece of furniture that he associated with her and weaning, her, weaning it out of her body like a puzzle piece. But the interesting thing, of course, is that this is, as I said, it looks like a photograph taken right from Dolly's front porch. On the right-hand side, this is a photograph by Clyde Butcher taken from Dolly's front porch. This is the exact same landscape about 80 years later. And you can see how Dolly really does capture the flavor of that landscape and those terraced hills in the background. It's a slightly different angle, but definitely you get the sense of how Dolly responded so totally to capturing his landscape. Dolly went on to say that each hill, each rocky contour might have been drawn by Leonardo himself. So one of his great loves was, of course, Leonardo da Vinci, and Dolly just constantly was amazed by how perfect his landscape seemed to be, perfect enough to have been drawn by his favorite artist, Leonardo da Vinci. This is a great painting in our collection. This is called Three Young Surrealist Women Holding in Their Arms the Skins of an Orchestra. And you can see that their heads are transformed into um, roses, so a bouquet of roses. And the three women are actually placed in this very surreal, dreamlike environment. Um, the sky is beautiful, it's bright blue, it's a little hazy. You have these incredible rock formations and there's this very long open beach. And then you have these three women who seem almost ghost-like. You'll see their clothes are somewhat tattered and torn. Um, and you could almost describe this in a way as a response to the time Dolly was spending at some of the fashion houses. He was very close with Elsa Scaparelli and Coco Chanel. He would watch the way that women would bring in their young uh, daughters and granddaughters to be fitted for their perfect debutante outfit. And that's sort of what we're witnessing here in a very, very surreal, strange way. So the woman on the left-hand side, who seems to have lost her blossom, so to speak, would be the matriarch of the family. She's brought the woman in the center, the woman who is right within bloom, who has a little bit of a tattered um, dress, 
and the woman on the far right is probably bringing an article of clothing to be tried on by the woman in the center. And yet, the, of course, the article of clothing is a melting watt or a melting uh, cello. The woman on the left-hand side is holding the skin of the piano, and we've talked about pianos in the landscape. And all of this is, in a way, a response to the environment that Dolly grew up in. So the rocks are very much from Capticreus. The beach is from Rosas. And this idea of a woman transforming into a head of roses is very much like the myth of, of Daphne, um, so transforming into nature. In the same way the butterfly metamorphosizes, here we have women metamorphosizing. So Dolly's very attuned to his environment, and yet it leads him to create these very surreal, dreamlike paintings. Dolly says elsewhere that I need to be in Port Legat. That's where his house was. I need to be in Port Legat to see the sailors the color of the olive trees and the bread, to feel the landscape with its unction and inner peace. And again, this is a photo of Dolly and Gala who seem to be resting on the rocks, exploring some of the items that, uh, that would have washed up on the beach. This is a just absolutely superior photograph by Clyde Butcher that became sort of the signature piece for our exhibition. And it's the beach just around the corner from Cadiquez, between Cadiquez and Port Legat, and Clyde has captured this sort of perfect moment with uh, the sun peeking out from the background during the morning hours. And then you can see this uh, painting on the left-hand side is right outside of Dolly's uh, front door, looking out upon the Mediterranean, capturing a very, very similar landscape with that landlocked little uh, bay area and the atmospheric effect that Clyde was able to capture within his photograph. This is a painting on the left-hand side of a place called Barracks, which is where the fishermen stored their nets. This is right outside of Dolly's front door. And Clyde's butcher photo, Clyde Butcher's photograph on the right-hand side, you can see that same barracks where the fishermen stored their um, nets on the far right-hand side, but there's also a very surreal object that's right in front of Dolly's um, front door, this boat that has a cypress tree growing through it. It's absolutely surreal, and yet it couldn't be more real and physical, and it's right outside of Dolly's front door, bringing the surreal into the environment. Clyde was also very much taken with Dolly's obsession with eggs. This is, uh, this is on the dovecote, in Dolly's house where the uh, doves would gather. Right on top of it, there's a large, beautiful egg that he was able to capture. And then he was also able to capture this little egg which is placed within the spiral curve right next to Dolly's pool, which rhymes really well, again, with Dolly's obsession with eggs and with the eggs that you'll encounter throughout the Selby Garden uh, exhibition. With that, I hope that you learned a little bit about Dolly's paintings and how they relate to the landscape, and I hope that it gave you a little bit of a better understanding of where the horticulture team drew inspiration for their amazing developments and designs throughout the Selby Gardens. I hope you enjoy the exhibition. I hope you get to come up and see the Dolly Museum's collection. Thank you very much for listening.